government form joins with Chairwoman Diane Watson, Subcommittee on Government Management, Organization, and Procurement, uh, to continue its ongoing oversight of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Also, that I didn't have with another member of the committee, my colleague on the uh, This is the fifth in a series of hearings, which the full committee began immediately after the passage of the Act to examine this extraordinary effort to rescue our troubled economy. This is also the second in a series of field hearings, which the committee embarked upon to observe exactly how the Recovery Act is performing in states, cities, and neighborhoods across the country. We began on the East Coast, New York State, and we now move 3,000 miles across the country to the West Coast and the state of California. Early last year, from coast to coast, it was drastically evident that our economy was in trouble. The nation was experiencing a nearly unprecedented level of job loss, foreclosures, and state and local budget deficits. As with almost every state in our union, the outlook in California was bleak. It was clear that it immediate and decisive action was necessary to slow the free fall of the economy. Congress acted decisively in passing the Recovery Act, the largest economic stimulus program since the New Deal. Recent news reports indicate that California is now showing signs of economic stabilization. Recovery Act spending may well be making a significant contribution to that stabilization. According to the Recovery Board, California has been awarded over $21 billion and received almost $8 billion in recovery funds so far. With those dollars, California reported just over 70,000 jobs funded by the Act between October the 1st and December 31st, 2009. We're here today to make sure that the Recovery Act is working and the Recovery Act dollars are properly accounted for. California will receive more Recovery Act funds than any other state in the nation. It is critical that we make sure those dollars flow rapidly, effectively and efficiently from the federal government to the state, from the state to the locality, from the local government to the contractors, and from the contractors to the paychecks of hardworking Californians trying to put on the family tables. In that regard, I have concerns about several key issues. There are reports that certain state agencies have failed to provide proper cash management, provide proper sub-recipient monitoring, and abide by federal reporting guidelines. We will explore these and related issues in today's hearing. We are not here today to lay blame and to point fingers and we are here to work constructively to ensure that taxpayers' dollars are properly used and accounted for. Today we want to better understand how Recovery Act dollars are being used in California and in other cities. <coughs> what are the unique obstacles statewide and locally to the use and tracking of recovery funds? Are we effectively preventing ways to broaden the use of Recovery Act funding? If not, what further steps need to be taken? Finally, I hope that we can identify areas in which we can improve the way in which the federal government, states, and cities work together towards rebuilding our nation's economic strength. Again, I want to thank our witnesses uh, for appearing today, and I look forward to your testimony. Now, at this time, I yield to the gentlewoman from California, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watts, who breaks my heart because she's the lead in that box. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns, for agreeing to hold this important joint bill hearing in my district, California's 33rd Congressional District, on the impact of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Today's hearing is the second of a series of field hearings the committee has undertaken to evaluate the implementation of the Recovery Act at the state and the local levels. When the Recovery Act was signed into law on February 17, 2009, $787 billion was appropriated in a nationwide effort to promote economic stability, to preserve and create jobs, to assist those most impacted 
session and to stabilize state and local government uh, budgets while also providing long-term economic benefits by investing in transportation, environmental protection, and in infrastructure. Today's field hearing is especially important because California has been awarded more funding than any other state in the nation while also struggling with a devastating state budget crisis, an estimated 12.1% statewide unemployment rate, and an even more severe unemployment crisis in its minority and youth communities. For the month of January, uh, the national jobless rate for African Americans was 16.5%. 12.6% for Hispanics and a whopping 24.4% for teenagers. And so you see, Mr. Chairman and committee members and colleagues and those in the audience, we have a huge challenge. And therefore, Mr. Chairman, without objection, I would like to submit the rest of my opening statement for the record and allow Congresswoman Judy Chu also a member of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, to deliver brief remarks using the remainder of my time. Without objection, so on. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Watson, for yielding. I want to spend my time highlighting an extraordinary effort, one of the most successful job creation programs created by the Recovery Act that created 10,000 jobs right here in LA County in less than a year. The unemployment rate here in California is 12%. The challenge is getting jobs up quickly so that people can put food on the table. Well, this program was spearheaded by Allen County, and in particular by County Supervisor Don Canabe, who was unfortunately not able to testify before the subcommittee today. He has, however, submitted a letter and a fact sheet, which I'd like to highlight uh, in my comments today. Uh, this job creation program was funded through a little-known uh, part of the Recovery Act called the Emergency Contingency Fund of TANF. Local workforce investment boards placed eligible job seekers in positions, and 80% of their salaries were funded by the stimulus funds. The employer <coughs> provided the rest. Participants are placed into subsidized jobs in all sectors of the economy, from nonprofits to government and to private business and they were matched with jobs that complemented their employment goals. The new job could not displace an existing employee or replace somebody who was about to be promoted. Some examples of these jobs were park rangers, receptionists, teacher's assistants, dental assistant trainees, customer service clerks, and child care workers. These workers made up to $10 an hour for up to 40 hours a week. The program was truly a win-win, benefiting both workers and businesses. Workers benefited by getting hands-on experience in a setting where they could earn wages, develop new, new skills, and enhance existing skills. Businesses benefited by getting the help that they needed uh, while temporarily dealing with uh, their payroll costs in a reasonable manner. Companies were able to try out these workers and ultimately could possibly hire these workers permanently as the economy improved. This job generated uh, by this uh, program uh, could help businesses expand in these difficult times by reducing their economic risk and their need for expensive loans. Programs like this were created all across the nation in 29 states, but LA's was the most successful, and I've been very um, energized in promoting this all across the country to our Congress members in D.C. By creating these subsidized jobs, we are truly providing the economic multipliers to get our uh, economy out of a recession. But the program is at risk. Funding expires on September 30th, and it would make 60,000 jobs disappear. That is why I am co-sponsoring and pushing very hard for an extension and an expansion of this bill through, uh, critical, through the critical funding that is needed so that we can make sure that Angelique knows get back to work. 
I do have good news uh, in that uh, the Senate bill uh, that Senator Kerry put together and put forth on Thursday does include this bill, but we do still have a long ways to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Let me yield to Congresswoman Napolitano for any comments that she might Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very pleased that I was invited to sit on the dais with you. Uh, this is of great importance to me, and uh, thank you, Chairwoman Watson, for holding me here in the Southern California area. Uh, I, I, I take, I associate my remarks with my colleagues. However, I also want to address some of the other issues that I find very disturbing. Uh, the Recovery Act has been very, very helpful in some of my areas. You see the media saying there is no jo new job development. There is, there is in my area, uh, transportation, uh, the, the several different things that have happened in my area. Teachers are still working because that helps in the school districts. So while you hear the negative negativism in the media, you must ask the local people what is really happening because it is helping maintain some of the jobs as the recovery uh, becomes more and more successful. It is slow, granted, but it's, it is there and it is building up. My uh, biggest concern at this point is, is several things. Fraud, uh, accountability and efficiency in those funds that come in from the federal government for my local institutions, whether it be cities, uh, uh, water uh, districts, etc. Because I think that the sort of taxpayer funds that are very hard to get to, and we must utilize every single dollar to its fullest extent and ensure that it is used properly and for the intended purpose. Um, the uh, House bill, the new uh, jobs house bill, um, that we do need that. We need the job training. We must increase the infrastructure, um, especially in recycled water. Water is economy. It's, it's money. If we're not able to ensure that those areas are assisted in water recycling so that in the future we do not have um, restricted water uh, tables, etc., that we must be sure that this includes training in our institutions for people to understand how critical water is for our area. Um, the other issue is transportation. And while uh, we talk about all of the millions, billions of dollars that come into California for the bone train, uh, well, I don't oppose it, I don't endorse it. I need mass transit for people to go to work, to go to school, uh, for people to move around when they need to without polluting the environment. And I'm sure, as many of you probably would entertain, that it does not bode well for those people who are working class to be able to use an expensive train uh, ticket unless they use maybe once in a while. That's a concern of mine. Uh, the, uh, in my area, uh, we have met with the uh, higher speed rail authority over the issues that, that are, are being held with uh, the money coming in and whether or not they're working with the communities to be able to ensure that right away is, is certain that uh, the cities are in tandem with what they're trying to do. So those, those are some of my biggest concerns. Uh, we do look for um, future work with the GAO, and I'm glad they're here especially with uh, Laura Chick, the new Inspector General for California, uh, we will be talking to you because we want to ensure that not only does the state do their part, but that we are in hand with what we're all doing. And so with that, I thank you very much, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, kind of the person that we've been talking about, uh, the stimulus money and what is it doing, and of course we need to work in ways to be able to improve and get it down to the community, because we are ready. Good afternoon, all of you. Um, I'm going to be brief because we're excited about having you here and the testimony that we're about to hear. Let me just say a couple points. One, I want to thank you, Chairman Towns, from uh, not only coming by way of Washington and being the chair of this committee, but also you could have very easily chosen to be in your own district in New York. And I was on a flight with him yesterday, and so we appreciate you coming here and giving real life testimony of the concerns in our community. Uh, to Congresswoman Diane Watson, um, Congratulations for bringing us all here. I don't think that there's a more important issue to talk about than what money we currently received, how are we using it, so we can move forward and say, what else can we do better? And um, you're going out with an incredible applause, I think, from all of us, and we're very grateful.
positions, you should feel comfortable that your representatives were on vital committees that are making key decisions that impact direct dollars coming here. Finally, uh, the last thing I'd like to say is my focus today is going to be number one on education. I'm quite disturbed, and I'll be very frank. I went to a uh, earlier rally this morning, and it was about the whole teacher situation and why is it that we've invested, I think, quite a lot of money, and yet it seems like tuition costs are going up, we're losing teacher positions, we're closing classrooms, and yet the money is coming. So I'd like to know where is the money. The second point is weatherization. It's my understanding that uh, some of the initial RFPs that came out um, have since been pulled back. I have several uh, different nonprofits in my area that are prepared to train people and to get the weatherization done, and we need to discuss that. And finally, I'd like to say on the transportation end, I was um, not as thrilled with the Tiger Grants that came out, which was the over $1 billion of discretionary funds that Secretary LeMitt had that we received, I think, very little. And the Undersecretary slipped a little bit. And he made a comment, and he said, well, you know, we tried to spread it around, you know, areas that got high-speed rail and also this, and we're like, wait a minute. You know, California is a large state. We're second, you know, largest in the United States. So just because and we're grateful for the $2 billion that we got for high-speed rail, that has nothing really to do with all of the other communities that we have to serve and transportation that needs to happen. So a few months ago, I went to Sacramento. I had an opportunity to sit down with Ms. Schick. We discussed um, some of the things that the governor's office is doing and what we look to do moving forward. And you should know she's very open, she's accessible, and wants to make it work. So I look forward to today's participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we move to our witnesses. We're delighted today to have with us Mayor Rogosa serving the second term as the 41st Mayor of Los Angeles. And of course, the uh, Mayor is also the Vice President of the United States Conference of Mayors. And prior to being elected as Mayor of Los Angeles in 2005, he served as a Speaker of the California State Assembly and as a Council Member to Los Angeles 14th District. We welcome you. Mayor. Uh, the Honorable Patrick Morris uh, was elected mayor of San Bernardino in 2006. Mayor Morris also serves as the president of the San Bernardino uh, International Airport and authority and co-chairman of the Inland and Valley Development Agency. We also welcome you to keep it as well. And of course, we have the Honorable Chuck Reed uh, was elected in 2006 as the 64th mayor of San Jose. Previously, Mayor Reed served as city council member of the 4th District of San Jose. Besides the service to the city of San Jose, Mayor Reed has also served our great nation as a member of the United States Air Force during the Vietnam War. Let me welcome all of you here. Uh, at this time, um, uh, it's a long-standing uh, tradition uh, that we always swear our witnesses in. And of course, I uh, ask you to Kind of to stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer the affirmative. I do. I do. Right, let the record reflect that they all answer the affirmative. You may be seated. So, Mr. Mayor, we will start with you. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I too uh, want to. Thank you for holding this hearing in the city of Los Angeles, Southern California area. As was mentioned, you could have held this anywhere. And the fact that you're shining the light on a part of the state that is critical to the direction of the state, is critical to the nation, we very much appreciate it. Of course, uh, Madam Chairwoman uh, Watson, we go back 20 years. Uh, it's great to see. Well, no, we, there's, there's life after politics, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, uh, I was out for a couple of years. Um, but let me just say how thankful we are for your leadership, for your extraordinary work as a school board member through very, very tough times in the city. President of the school board, member of the Senate, and now member of the Congress of LA uh, is going to miss your advocacy. And I just want to thank you for your service. And kind of 
Times number two, and I also go back to the 1970s, the young idealistic college students. And I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for your support and your advocacy, both as a member of the Assembly and now as a uh, Board of Equalization, and now as a member of the Congress. And I've had the great fortune to have worked uh, very closely with Congress member Napolitano, who served in the California legislature together. And couldn't be prouder to have her and, uh, as one of uh, our members of the LA delegation. Thank you for being here. And finally, uh, Congress member Richardson, who I'm proud to support early on. And I uh, just uh, want to thank you for shining a light on some of the issues that you mentioned, particularly around our schools. Um, and uh, let me just say to, to my fellow mayors, it's great to be here with you as well. I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, for you today. And at the outset, let me just say uh, that the city of Los Angeles is faithful to President Obama and the Congress, particularly the House, because uh, I think the House understood, with the consent, uh, the importance of metropolitan areas. And it's something that I'm going to speak to in just a moment. But I want to thank the Congress uh, and, of course, President Obama for the passage of the Recovery Act and the funds that Los Angeles has been awarded Today, the city has been awarded $592 million in Recovery Act funds. With these funds, we've created or retained uh, 1,681 jobs, of which 869 temporary summer youth jobs, for training our local workforce, preparing our infrastructure, improving our environment, and assisting those most impacted uh, by this economic downturn. I would, of course, like to see more funding come to Los Angeles, and particularly our fair share. You know, it's important to not to know and it, that LA, that California does get uh, the most money, uh, but we're also by far the largest state uh, on a per capita basis. Uh, many of us in California believe that uh, we need uh, to get a higher return on our uh, tax investment. Uh, we, we understand that we'll never get a one-to-one Return. I know New York is in the same situation, but we do think we need to uh, shorten the distance between what we give and what we get. Uh, look forward to working, of course, with our congressional delegation who have always been able to count on uh, to advocate for our, um, our region. Uh, let me give you a snapshot of what's happening today in the city of Los Angeles. We're facing unprecedented times and economic challenges. Just to give you an example, two years ago we had a $292 million, uh, $240 million budget deficit. Last year uh, we had a $530 million budget deficit. Two years ago we resolved that first deficit, then we resolved 400 of the $530 million deficit at a $175 million drop in revenues. We're facing in the current year a $212 million deficit after cutting more than $600 million out of a $4.4 uh, billion general fund. Uh, unlike anything, uh, these are uh, deficits unlike anything we've seen uh, in generations. The unemployment rate, I remember being in the White House with President Obama when he said that the, the worst case scenario would be a double digit unemployment rate. Well, uh, I raised my hand and said the worst case scenario is coming to Los Angeles. Today, our unemployment rate is at 14%. In the area that Congress member Richardson represent, that represents, that number is closer to 20%. Uh, when you look at these numbers, they're at, and, and the same with uh, Congress member uh, Watson, when you look at these numbers, they're astronomical. Uh, not since the Great Depression have we seen this many people out of work. Some of our most important industries, like construction, as you know, Four years that I've been more, uh, if you look downtown in Hollywood, uh, construction uh, has been at its all-time high four years in a row. 30% drop, 30% uh, unemployment rate in that um, industry. Our tax revenue from property sales, business, documentary, transfer, and hotel occupancy uh, uh, are down by more than 30%. For the remainder of our fiscal years, I said we're facing 212 million dollar deficit and we're project, projecting a 485 million dollar deficit next year. We've instituted the most generous early retirement package in the nation of 2,400 employees so that we 
didn't have to lay off. Uh, but this year, we're, uh, we're going to be looking at layoffs, furloughs, and salary cuts just to make uh, payroll. So how Recovery Act funds uh, impacted our financial situation? Well, the real answer, not as much as we would like. One of the five goals of the Recovery Act was to stabilize state and local budgets. Unfortunately, uh, state, while well, state budgets and school districts receive recovery funds to stabilize their budgets, municipal governments have not. The recovery funds we receive for the most part cannot be used to supplant local funds. Rather, these funds must be used to ex expand existing programs or launch new initiatives that will be difficult to sustain once the recovery funds are expended. With that said, my first recommendation to the committee is to allow municipalities to use recovery for funds for budget stabilization. Now, I know that my friend uh, and fellow, one of your colleagues, Congressmember Miller, is putting forth a jobs bill that will do just that. Uh, and I commend him for that. I met with him last week, and I asked him to move that through uh, the House uh, as quickly as possible. Cities need help now. As the Vice President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I found that this problem is not unique uh, to the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the city of San Jose and uh, San Bernardino are all here, uh, and they can tell you the cities all across the country are facing virtually the same scenario that I just uh, painted for our own city. We're going to get this country on the road to recovery. That road begins in our cities. Let me state that 88% of the gross domestic product is located in our cities. 82% of the unemployment rate is located in our cities. 80% of the foreclosures are located in cities. But when the shovel-ready infrastructure money was distributed, states received 70% of the money, while metropolitan areas received 30 uh, that, that, I know, was something that the and that's why I mentioned the House, that the House wanted to fix, the Senate didn't. Ultimately, we distributed that money on a 70-30 basis. And, and what I said back then, when I was in the White House, yes, we're gonna, when, we, when we distribute money 70% to the states and 30 to the cities, we may build a road. But that road is going to connect the ducks to the geese. And in the case of Miss Richardson's district, we could build a bridge to connect the two biggest ports in the United States of America, Long Beach uh, and Los Angeles. That's a different kind of infrastructure project. Uh, and so infrastructure money that is spent in cities creates jobs as well as improves mobility and air quality. That brings my second recommendation, to send more of the recovery funds directly to metropolitan areas. Now another issue uh, is the siloing of funds that has limited our ability to utilize funds where they can do the most good or the, where the need is greatest. For example, in one area of the city, we may receive funds to improve policing services, but not to fix the streets, conduct weatherization of homes, add energy efficiency, lighting, or prevent foreclosure. How much more efficient it would be if we had the flexibility uh, on how and where recovery funds were used, flexibility like we have with the community development block grant program that allows us to nimbly uh, put money where the need is. Another concern with existing grant programs is the missing link to job creation, which is the number one priority of my administration. It's been the central focus of your work and of the Recovery Act. Here's a good example. We just received, and thank you very much for that, and I was with the members of the Congress and the Senate when we received it, 7.5 million for broadband expansion funding uh, we received, by the way, that one, our fair share, we received more than any city in the country. But, while this funding was allowed, will allow us to bridge the digital divide by creating 4,000 workstations in public libraries, recreations, and community centers, it can only create one job. So my third recommendation is to break down the solid side of recovery funds and allow greater flexibility in how the funds may be used in order to maximize job creation. Finally, LA will be negatively impacted due to the interpretations by federal agencies of Recovery Act language. When we received shovel-ready infrastructure funding through the Recovery Act, we identified, because if you remember at the time they said, you have to get this out in 90 days. Well, most of these projects, infrastructure projects in New York and LA and San Jose, you can't put shovel-ready big projects like that. 
uh, you know, together in 90 days, it just doesn't exist. So what we identified was street resurfacing. Most of us have uh, streets that need great deal repair as one of the main ways to get projects immediately underway. It was a way to put people to work and spend money in the shortest period of time. And so using our workforce, we started our street resurfacing program. Then we were told by the Federal Highway Administration uh, last August that we would be re prohibited from using city workers for any project started after July 28th. Now, we're faced with a situation where we're funding for future projects, but we're going to have to lay off all of the workers, or many of the workers, who do our street resurfacing because of our budget problems. That makes no sense, and, and therefore my last recommendation is that the Congress allow the use of, of uh, force account labor on Recovery Act funded projects and not set a higher standard than normal federally funded highway projects. Again, I want to thank uh, the members who are here. Uh, I feel heartened uh, that you all decided to come uh, to Southern California. Heartened, uh, I know that I'm preaching to the choir because many of you have mentioned some of these same issues. Uh, I only hope uh, that, uh, that as more cities uh, in the course of your hearings begin to raise these issues, we'll be better able uh, to put uh, shovel-ready projects into effect, create the jobs that is critical, and retain city workforces at a time uh, when uh, our cities are facing unprecedented uh, financial crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Mayor Morris. Honorable Chairman, co-chairman, uh, members of the committee. I first of all want to turn to Diane Watson and Mayor Villaraigosa. Thank her on behalf of Los Angeles, on behalf of uh, the Inland Empire, and all of Southern California, and indeed the state. I want to thank her for a lot of time. Well, I'm just a little closer to you. A lifetime of service uh, to this state, uh, to this region, to this nation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a little nervous. Before me is a um, digital clock. Uh, it started at five minutes. I'm already 30 seconds into my five minutes. Uh, I, I time my, having talked to your staff, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, timed my comments to about 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm told that you will not uh, buzz me. Uh, I hope you'll. As a mayor, I buzz people all the time. I'm I hope you know, Mr. Mayor, the trap door. <laughs>
great welcoming relief uh, to that uh, dark background. To date, our city has received uh, $20 million in American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds to hire new police officers, purchase and rehabilitate foreclosed homes, initiate homeless prevention programs, build new community amenities, and spark economic development uh, through energy efficient and renewable energy programs. These city investments of our funds have translated into over 100 direct jobs uh, with an additional estimated 80 to 130 induced jobs for infrastructure and construction projects. It's important to note that, that our city's job numbers are not as significant as one might expect with $20 million in investment. The reason is that 65% of the city's RF funds have gone toward direct government services, while only 35% have been for infrastructure and construction projects. At the regional level, the job picture is quite different. And a member of Sandbag, the transportation planning agency for our county, which has received over $180 million in ARA funds, all of the ARA funds received by Sandbag have been directed into infrastructure and construction projects, which have translated into a whopping 2,300 jobs. The lesson learned, if the primary goal of federal stimulus funds is immediate job creation, federal stimulus dollars for infrastructure creates many more jobs per dollar than stimulus funds for direct government services. There is an equally important lesson to be learned about the manner in which ARA funds can be leveraged with local resources when invested in infrastructure projects. In the Inland Empire, the regional leaders leveraged ARA funds with local funds to create hundreds of additional jobs. Let me explain. We have a $700 million Interstate 215 project that involves the reconstruction and widening of 7.5 miles of critical transportation infrastructure through our city. In the summer of 2009, that project was in jeopardy of coming to a standstill due to the lack of uh, state bond funding. Not only would a standstill have been costly to our local economy, it also risks sandbags being unable to take advantage of a 30% reduction in construction costs because of lower construction dates. When Sandbag received the $128 million in era funding for transportation projects, Further scattered these resources across the broad landscape of the nation's largest county, we directed it specifically to the one project I've identified, the I-215 freeway project, and locked in substantial, over 30% reduction in construction costs in the current economy. And that's the leverage. As a result of the construction cost savings, our sandbag board created its own local stimulus program. $31 million uh, in construction savings be immediately directed toward local transportation infrastructure projects, thus creating an additional 565 jobs uh, in both direct and indirect job creation locally. The lesson learned, by making a strategic use of a large lump sum of federal stimulus dollars, regions can leverage additional local resources in a way that broadens and deepens the economic and job creation objectives of the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The newly created Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program is another success story on how ERA funds can optimistically be used by local governments, and it provides an important lesson on how federal stimulus dollars should be allocated. Similar to the highly successful Community Development Block Grant Program, the Energy Efficient Block Grants are allocated directly to cities and counties projects that have energy efficiency improvements and service to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Our city was awarded $2 million for this program, and we began to implement projects that will immediately put contractors, architects, and engineers to work with energy efficiency construction projects that will have a transformative effect on our local economy. Because this money is provided directly to local jurisdictions through flexible block grants, the limited federal dollars can be matched with local funds and economic development strategies to broaden and deepen the economic and job creation objectives of our. In our city, we are leveraging our EE uh, CBG federal funds with private funding 
to the development of our AB 811 uh, program, or PACE programs, as they are known at the federal level. Our city is partnering with the county, combining portions of our collective EEBGC funds to implement a program that creates a pool of secure and low-cost private capital to fund major retrofit projects on homes and businesses that reduce energy and water consumption and generate renewable energy. These projects will give our local economy an enormous boost. We estimate for every 800 loans issued, a direct economic impact of some $20 million will be infused to the local economy. This example illustrates how when given federal funds directly without tight federal and state constraints, we at the local level use innovation and creativity to ignite our own local economies. An opposite example is the federal funds that, flowed, that have flowed thus far through the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. <coughs> Prior to the receipt of the NSP funds, our city had designed a program that would have used NSP funds to purchase foreclosed homes in tipping point neighborhoods to ensure that these homes remain owner occupied. The plan was designed to prevent stable neighborhoods with high owner occupancy levels from being destabilized with the purchase of foreclosed homes by absentee landlords. A historic problem that has plagued our city during the previous foreclosure crises in the late 90s and the mid 80s. In essence, we wanted to prevent bad history from repeating itself. However, when the guidelines were released, we were informed that the NSP funds could only be spent in certain census tracts, and those tracts did not align with our city's very strategic neighborhood stabilization program. So federal guidelines dictated to us where to place these resources without any first-hand knowledge of our community or its housing issues and needs. It's critically important that local government be allowed to determine where best to direct resources to ensure maximum benefit for program objectives. Lessons learned, federal stimulus dollars that are block granted to local regions and cities without being channeled through historic and often Byzantine state and federal funding silos create the flexibility needed to maximize the beneficial impact of these federal funds on our local economy. To summarize, I would strongly urge members of Congress uh, and the body, as it considers additional federal stimulus funding, to consider the lessons learned from the use of ARA funds in the England Empire. One, target federal stimulus funding to infrastructure projects because it creates the greatest number of jobs. Two, flow federal stimulus funding directly to local and regional governments through flexible block grants. This allows federal funds to be matched with unique local opportunities, monies, and economic development strategies that maximize the results. In a nutshell, continued direct flexible block grant funding for infrastructure and energy projects is critical to our collective success in helping the economic recovery of our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. <coughs> Thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm from San Jose, the 10th largest city in the country, a city of uh, over a million people, representing Northern California. Uh, we're very proud to be the capital of the Silicon Valley, the innovation center of the world, and uh, proud of the jobs that we've created that we've ex exported to many other states. We're not necessarily happy about exporting jobs to other states, but we're proud of it. Because the work, the innovation, the creativity that comes out of Silicon Valley has created uh, products and services that have changed the world and jobs for uh, untold numbers of Americans around the country, and we're very proud of that. But as a job creation center, the recession has hit us hard. We were still adding jobs in San Jose and Silicon Valley until the capital market crash in uh, about September of 2008. And since then, we've lost 50,000 jobs in San Jose alone and more in the rest of Silicon Valley. So I, I speak for us to thank you and Congress and the Obama administration for this ARPA, this uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the stimulus package has made it a difference, <coughs> made a difference locally, and more importantly, it was a great relief that we saw the national economy turn the corner. The rate of job losses continue to decline and gross domestic product rising. Because we know that uh, as a job creation center, that once the national economy turns, we're going to start growing the net jobs again. 
And I believe that this year will be a year in which uh, net jobs are created in Silicon Valley and will again uh, continue to export jobs uh, to other states. So we're very grateful for the federal funding that's come directly to San Jose. We're grateful for what it's done to the economy. Uh, we can spend as much money as you can give us. I think that's probably true with any mayor. So I'm happy to take any more money that Congress wants to send our way. But I'm very grateful uh, for what we have received and the impact on the economy. Because although I can't, uh, I guess I shouldn't complain in the company of my fellow mayors, we have higher unemployment rates than we do in San Jose. Uh, but our unemployment rate exceeds the national average. And uh, we have lost a lot of jobs. But we're on the way back, I believe, in large part because of the stimulus program, the package, and the spending that's uh, that changed the economy. More specifically, in San Jose, we, uh, by formula calculate, we'll receive about $105 million of stimulus funding. We have been awarded $70 million uh, to date, and we have spent 22% of that. And I think that's an important thing for everybody to remember, trying to calculate the economic impact, is that the money was not all intended to be spent in the first year, and we certainly haven't done that. Uh, the process of getting the awards out and then us bidding it, of course, uh, slowed things down a little bit. But that's good because there's still money that's going to affect the economy this year. Uh, we are tracking the dollars very closely. I was in Washington, D.C. last year on the day that the conference committee decided what the stimulus package was going to look like. And I heard loud and clear from the Obama administration, from members of Congress, don't mess this up. We're going to put out a lot of money, and local governments have to be very careful to spend it the way Congress intended, do the oversight, because there will be plenty of people looking to criticize it, plenty of uh, opportunities to make mistakes, just be careful and do it right. And we have. Uh, even though we're not necessarily getting reimbursed for the oversight, if you're going to give us $100 million and we're going to take it, I think we're obligated to do some oversight. And so our city manager's been tasked with tracking the money, doing the reports, doing them timely, and we've asked our, our city auditor to look over the manager's shoulder. So we're very confident that we know where every dollar went, and we'll be able to track that. But I can't say that for every other city, because I know that those general fund dollars that have to get spent on these kinds of things to implement some of these special programs are hard to come by. Our, our city is no stranger to a budget shortfalls and gaps, and I don't think there's a city in California that doesn't have problems. So if there's a, some improvement that could be made, it's in the clarity of the oversight and the funding that could be used for oversight out of our funds. It's really important because it will encourage other cities and other local governments to do the appropriate oversight to make sure that we spend it the way you wanted it spent. But I'm very confident that we can do that in San Jose. We have been doing that. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit about the future as I see the stimulus money impacting the economy. We have a different view in San Jose, perhaps, than the rest of the country because of the innovation that happens in San Jose. But there are some, some specific programs beyond the direct funding that's coming to cities and beyond uh, some of the things that have been mentioned today. And that is funding for innovation, funding, uh, for example, through the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program. One of the things that happened when the capital markets crashed in September of 08 was it made practically impossible for small businesses and growing businesses uh, to get access to the capital markets to be able to borrow the money that they need to finance their expansions and their factories. We have 10 companies in San Jose that have, have applications in for Department of Energy loan guarantees. Each of those companies will create jobs. Each of those companies will invest in San Jose if those guarantees are awarded them. We have a, a couple of them that are at the sort of the leading edge of the process and they're going through the, the finalizing it. But we do know that there are companies, such as NanoSolar, one of our companies, that produces the uh, world's most cost-effective solar cell. They have an application in for a Department of Energy loan guarantee. They cannot get money to the capital markets. Even though they have uh, raised hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital funding from the private sector, they have hundreds of patents, they have a factory, they have a product, they're making profits. Their manufacturing capacity is sold out for the next three years, but they have a great product. They can't borrow the money. So without the DOE loan guarantees, they're, they may wander off into another country because there are other countries who want them to make their next factory there. So these Department of Energy loan guarantees, and I know there's other programs in some of the other agencies, I think are going to be vitally important in the 
coming year for the ongoing impact on the economy beyond the direct spending. And I want to thank uh, Congress for allowing those programs to be a part of this package because it is the creation of long-term permanent private sector jobs that will have the most impact on our economy. I was in Washington uh, back in November, December time frame with the League of National Cities and the four mayors on the panel. We all agreed that we can spend as much money as you can give us, but if we're creating jobs that will disappear as soon as the funding stops, that's not going to have a lasting impact on our economy. That to the extent a, a jobs bill or a stimulus package or anything else gets done, it's important to try to focus on those areas that will help create those long-term permanent jobs because those are the jobs that will keep our people working after the federal government stops writing the checks. And that's ultimately better for us and better for the country. So with that, I want to thank you for the, for the funding. We appreciate it. We're spending it. People are working. The impacts are there. And uh, we're very grateful uh, for what Congress has done and what the Obama administration has done to help us get out of this recession. Thank you very much, Jefferson. and thank both of you for your testimony. Let me just uh, indicate the fact that uh, I understand you talked about uh, basically an unfunded mandate, really, because we're asking for certain information. Uh,